Sometime in the mid-1900s, our grandfather removed a little wooden dining table from a restaurant. It's okay, it's one of the things you were allowed to do back then, apparently. Especially if the restaurant didn't need it anymore, and if the restaurant was in the family. And it didn't, and was. He took the little wooden dining table home and gave it the once-over. Dark brown in color, four slender, outward curving legs, hand joinery, solid hardware, and two little drop-in leaves that barely widened the table by a foot at the most. Kind of a plain-looking thing, really, but it would do the job. You couldn't spread out a modern big-box board game on it, but since those didn't exist, it would keep the plates and silverware off the floor. Being a restaurant table, it had its share of use, and probably abuse, though in those days people were perhaps more inclined to be respectful to public furnishings than they are now. Nothing terribly major wrong with a little wooden dining table, but it would certainly need some cleaning up and refinishing. Which was fine. He knew how to do that. There were a few people like that in our lives, people who just seemed to know how to do all the things that needed doing. We weren't clear about how they learned it all, but they had. It seemed to us that it was just a natural part of being an adult, this knowing about things and being competent at whatever you put your hand to. And so, the little wooden dining table was sanded and cleaned up and given a fresh new coat of stain and finish. Over the years, it was part and parcel of every gathering at the house. Thanksgivings, Christmases, and birthdays were all celebrated at the little wooden dining table. Aunts, uncles, wives, mothers, daughters, grandchildren, great-grandmothers, cousins, brothers, and sisters were, at one time or another, and once in a great while all at once, gathered around a table that was certainly very much too small for so many people. So we never remembered it being that way. To us, it was just the table that got used at all the special occasions. There was another table that sat in the kitchen proper, but it was a metal table and just for eating meals at and probably came in years later. It wasn't meant for gathering around and being together at like the little wooden dining table in the dining room. As long as you don't count sweet potatoes with marshmallows on them and Brussels sprouts cooked until they were grayish yellow, we have many happy memories about and around that little wooden dining table. But eventually, time catches up with us all, and many years later the little wooden dining table has come to live with us in our house. It's the main dining table under our roof and continues to keep plates and silverware off the floor very well. But certain flaws in its design and treatment have made themselves known, things we never noticed before. The leaves don't run straight, so there's always a little gap between them. The arrangement of the legs sometimes mean that as the table is used, it gradually walks itself apart, making the little gap just that much bigger. If you don't push it back together every few days, you risk losing a utensil down there. Over the years, the joints have loosened, and it makes a little symphony of creaks and squeaks as people settle around it. In other words, it's developed even more character than it had before. But perhaps the most problematic part of the little wooden dining table these days is the finish. It's only ever, as far as we know, had that one refinishing 60 plus years ago. It was starting to wear out when we got it, and it hasn't improved any in the time since. In warm weather, or a warm house, it's a bit sticky. If you set a hot plate down on it, the plate will glue itself to the tabletop as the heat softens the finish, which then hardens again as it cools. Great for making sure plates don't slide off, not so great if what you want to do is actually pick the plate up again. The finish has, by and large, lost its shine and luster, and if you spill anything on it, you need to jump up and dry it off right away, otherwise that too can soften and mar the finish. And if what you spilled on it was alcohol, well, you've essentially stripped the finish right off it, leaving a bare spot on the wood, which will be handy to know when we finally get around to refinishing it again ourselves. Except this time, we probably won't use shellac. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The Indian jujube is a fruit-bearing tree found in many of the tropical regions of the Old World, from southern Africa to the Indian subcontinent. It produces a small fruit about the size of a large grape, and about the same consistency and taste as an apple. It's a staple part of the Indian diet thanks to the hardiness of the tree, 
its tolerance of drought conditions, and its rapid growth cycle. A single tree can yield between 80 and 200 kilograms of fruit a year in its prime. The tree and its fruit are remarkably useful. The fruit, sometimes called the Indian plum, has the second most vitamin C of any fruit in the world. They can be eaten raw or stewed, dried or candied, pickled or turned into a kind of butter. Camels, cattle, and goats eat their nutritious leaves, and the flowers are a source of bee nectar that makes a light honey. The wood of the tree is hard and used in construction and furniture making. It can become an excellent charcoal, and the thorny branches are used to make corrals for livestock. The seeds are a sedative and mixed with buttermilk can settle stomachs and reduce diarrhea. Properly prepared, the leaves relieve asthma and fever, the bark halts dysentery, and the roots of the tree help with gout and rheumatism, and in a final bout of genuine helpfulness, the oil of the seed of the Indian jujube, also called a burr tree, makes an excellent biodiesel. It's a lot of good from one tree. It's a widely cultivated, important crop. Sadly though, the burr tree has a problem. It's not that it is considered an invasive species in many parts of the world in which it occurs, particularly Australia, though it is. No, instead, in India, the bird tree is beset by an insect pest. This insect, in the family Caryidae, goes through several stages during its life, from egg to larva to adult, with stops along the way. It's a kind of scale insect, meaning that in its adult form, the female looks like a flat scale on a tree branch, and several of them together can give the appearance of a sort of armored skin over the bark of a tree. They're almost universally considered a pest because they latch onto a plant stem or tree branch and pierce the bark to get at the soft living tissue of the plant and suck out the rich sap used to transport nutrients around their host. Enough of them in one place can ruin a fruit harvest and seriously damage a burr tree so that new growth is impeded and fruits don't mature and ripen properly. The nutrients they need never reach them, instead going to the insects. Infestations of Carialaca can seriously harm the production of entire orchards. Unless, of course, you want Carialaca taking up residence near burr tree orchard. And many, many people do. Millions of them. Why? Because the thing you get from a Caria infested orchard, you can't get otherwise. And that thing, shellac, is far, far more valuable than all the products of the burr tree by itself. The larval stage of the Caria laca is called a crawler, and as it goes about its business of feeding on the phloem of the burr tree, it produces wax secretions to cover the holes it makes. These wax secretions form long tubes that gradually dry out with exposure to the elements, forming long, hollow sticks and making what is referred to as stick lac. From this comes the material we refer to as shellac. Shellac is actually more of a resin than a wax because the secretions of the lac insect combine with the secretions of the tree itself to make the final product rather than being wholly produced by the lac bug alone. The dried stick lac, though often available in this raw form, is more often collected, broken up into flakes, and put into a canvas bag, which is then heated over a fire. As the lac liquefies, impurities are left behind as it drips through the bag to be collected below. The shellac is then allowed to dry, either into thin sheets which are then broken up, or into what are called buttons, little discs of shellac. The shellac is then bagged and sold. Production is simple and inexpensive, and very tidy profits can be made on the world market. Purchased shellac is dissolved into ethyl alcohol by the pound, called the pound cut. Thus, a three pound cut uses three pounds of dried, crushed shellac dissolved into one gallon of ethyl alcohol to make liquid shellac. It takes somewhere between 25,000 and 150,000 lac bugs to produce a pound of prepared shellac. Entire orchards of burr trees are planted just so the lac bug can be farmed there, and different varieties of trees produce different colors of shellac. The kusum tree, for instance, produces the lightest colored shellacs, often called blonde shellacs. The most common usage of shellac is as a preservative and finish for wood. It's incredibly easy to use and produces excellent results, yielding anything from a nearly clear finish that allows the natural colors of the wood to show through, 
to deep browns, reds, and oranges. It dries quickly and produces a natural shine when fully dry, requiring little additional effort from the user. Being so easily produced and so easily worked with means that shellac has long been in use throughout history. Early historical records of woodworking, and especially wood finishing, are spotty at best, because really, there wasn't much to it, and people were too busy actually working to write things down. There still exist a few mentions of woodworking processes dating back through time, though, that can be tracked down to show some of the major changes. Early examples in various archaeological finds have shown that natural stains such as walnut and the oils of various plants were in use for the most part prior to written records being kept. Even shellac was originally valued not for its preservative properties, but for the colors of the dyes that could be extracted from it. In 250 BCE, Roman writer Claudius Aelianus mentioned lac dye and the way it is prized for its red hues. Not surprising when you consider that the cochineal bug is from the same superfamily as the lac bug, and it has been crushed and used for red dye production since the prehistoric age. Going further back, the Mahabharata mentioned shellac as a construction material, with a passing reference to a palace made entirely from dried shellac. It isn't until the 13th century that shellac really takes off, though. In 1220 CE, it gets mentioned as an artist's pigment in Spain, and then, finally, someone in Venice uses it not as a colorant, but as a preservative to protect the finishes on cassones, decorated and carved Italian dowry chests placed in the bridal suite to show off the dowries paid by the bride's family. Shortly thereafter, shellac becomes the go-to finish for expensive-looking wood for the next 300 years or so, eventually becoming so popular that everyone uses it on everything. In 1781, James Kerr wrote to the Royal Society of London. In an article explaining the many uses to which shellac could be put, called The Natural History of the Insect Which Produces the Gum Lacca, he praises the insect's usefulness and calls out its contributions. At the time, people were using shellac as beads for ornamentation, combining it with cinnabar, otherwise known as mercury sulfide, to make an excellent sealing wax, using it for japanning, making grindstones by mixing shellac and fine river sand, using it in painting and dyeing, and finally making something called Spanish wool, a makeup sometimes composed of a red coloring, in this case shellac, gum arabic, and quicklime, a substance known to severely irritate and even peel skin in the presence of moisture. Ah, the price of beauty. Japanning, by the way, was an attempt by Europeans to imitate an extremely popular method of lacquering developed in and known only to Japan. The poisonous sap of the Japanese lacquer tree had long been used by skilled Japanese artisans to produce works of art and furniture with stunning, rich, deep colors that, when they finally reached Europe in the 16th and 17th century, people went crazy for. So crazy were they that European artisans and craftsmen were in danger of going out of business as the demand for Japanese lacquer work grew to the exclusion of all else. Finally, in the late 17th century, rumors that the best materials and pieces weren't being exported from Japan, combined with high demand for those same pieces, forced Italian craftsmen to come up with a way of getting the same results without using the same methods, and so Japaning was born. Unlike the Japanese method, which produced impressive colors, particularly red, the Italian method found its success by making blacks blacker, thereby showing other colors better because of greater contrast. Much like your modern OLED TVs. But Japaning was just one of the finishes that shellac could create. Undoubtedly, the most impressive and dramatic finish you can get is called French polish. Not only did French polish produce an extremely glossy, colorful surface, it gave wood something normally only found in certain gemstones and the occasional child's marble. Chatoyancy. Also called cat's eye effect, chatoyancy occurs when a gemstone, like quartz, beryl, or moonstone, has a distinct fibrous structure or inclusion which, when the stone is polished and prepared, results in a play of light described as a silk-like sheen. This effect is also seen in some of the better cat's eyes marbles, which attempted to emulate the same sort of chatoyancy as the gemstones. Though not those bluey, reddy, greeny ones that started flooding the marble markets in the 50s. No one wants those. 
French polish achieves its effect by a careful series of labor-intensive steps. It's not like a traditional stain or finish that you just wipe on and then off again. It's an entire process. Generally speaking, the more exotic the wood is, the better the end results will be, though any wood, especially hardwood, that has undergone stress from its own weight will produce the effect. Beginning with a thin coat of shellac to seal and prepare the wood, the finish is built up in layers over time, by means of specific motions while applying subsequent layers that help ensure a streak-free shine. Sanding with fine grit sandpapers as each layer is dried and then applying the next layer consistently, followed by oiling the wood at various stages, produces over time a finish that reveals the deep patterns in the wood and gives the impression of impressive depth that other methods simply can't replicate. Fine furniture and expensive stringed instruments are often finished this way, and you can see examples of this finish in the violin family of instruments in particular. Although French polish is easy to repair in the event of damage, as a new layer of shellac can be applied and worked without having to strip the entire piece down to bare wood, it has fallen out of favor since the 1930s with most manufacturers, because it's so labor and time intensive. But, like Mr. Kerr pointed out to the Royal Society, shellac is used in a lot of places besides wood finishing, especially these days. And it's fair to say that without shellac, you probably wouldn't be able to hear us today, for a number of reasons. First, keep in mind that shellac is the product of an animal going about its daily business of animaling. Sure, we refine it and clean it a bit, but we don't change shellac much from its natural form until we get it to its final use. Now, we don't recommend grabbing a big handful of the stuff and chowing down, but shellac is edible. We're even willing to make a strong bet that you've eaten shellac without really knowing it. If you've ever had occasion to look up food additive E904, you're looking at shellac. Still not recognizing it? Look for the words confectioner's glaze, natural glaze, confectioner's resin, or something similar in the ingredients list. It also crops up as a pharmaceutical glaze because it is used as a pill coating to help keep moisture out of sensitive medicines and prevents the escape of any unpleasant chemically odors from the tablets and capsules it is used on. It's also used if that medicine needs to be time-released, as shellac is more difficult for the body to break down. In the case of food, most citrus fruit is covered in a very thin layer of shellac, as are apples, to replace the natural waxes from these fruits washed off in the cleaning process, which helps keep moisture inside the fruit and makes it last longer, while also giving it a pleasing shiny look. If you're a particular fan of chocolate-covered foods, that neato shine on the outside of your chocolate-covered raisin, peanut, or coffee bean is also from shellac. Basically, if it's a candy or food and it shines, it's probably shellac hard at work. Prior to the advent of plastics, shellac was often used as material for making small goods. It's durable as long as it's not heated and reasonably easy to work with, so you often see things like old picture frames and inkwells made from it. Mix it with a bit of pine resin or phenyl formaldehyde, and you have an early form of plastic, which was used in many electrical applications. In fact, there have been so many uses for shellac over the years that we're going to have to force ourselves to focus a bit and just look at the two most important ones that led us to make this statement earlier that without shellac, you probably wouldn't be able to hear us today. And it's a twofer, though we've already hinted at one of them. In the late 1800s, Mr. Thomas Alva Edison, unjustified target of internet meme lords everywhere, was busy inventing a way to both record and reproduce sound. Sound recording had been invented and worked out 30 years before, but no one had thought that it might be useful to be able to play it back eventually. Edison landed on a system whereby a piece of tinfoil wrapped around a cylinder could have the sounds etched onto it and then be played back on the same machine but mostly it was just a novelty at the time and too impractical and frankly crummy sounding to be of much use to anyone. Ten years later, Edison would eventually improve the system by changing the recording medium from tinfoil to wax cylinders, making the recordings not only sound better, but also last longer. And so the recorded sound market was born, with Edison as its primary beneficiary into the early 20th century. In 1886, though, 
a man named Emil Berliner began experimenting with other ways of performing the same trick. He'd already worked out a way to improve Edison's telephone receiver, but Edison's patent would eventually mean Berliner couldn't do much with it, so he turned his attention to Edison's phonograph and began trying to make that better instead. In 1887, he received the first patent for his improvement, the gramophone. Initially, the gramophone was mostly about making the recording process simpler and easier. He retained the idea of the sound being etched onto a cylinder, but sought out other material that would be easier to work with and, importantly, easier to reproduce than wax. Eventually, he hit on the idea of laying a thin coating of wax over a zinc disc instead of a cylinder, and then acid etching the resulting line into a playable groove. By 1890, he set about producing gramophone records. Unfortunately, because of patents again, the only place he could make them was in Europe, and even then, they were only little hand-cranked toys. Small, hard rubber 5-inch discs were stamped out of the Zinc Masters and sold for children, but this wasn't what Berliner had in mind. He wanted a full, usable-by-adults system of records and playback devices, and he wanted them the world over. It took four years, but he eventually secured $25,000 in investment money and opened the United States Gramophone Company, which set about making larger 7-inch discs and better-sounding players. Now, a lot happens in between there and here. The United States Gramophone becomes the Victor Talking Machine Company, which eventually, many years later, becomes RCA Victor. But that's another story. Discs go from 7 to 10 inches, and play times go from 2 to 4 minutes, enough for entire songs to be played as playback speeds start to standardize around 78 RPM. And suddenly, the disc gramophone wins the very first audio format war. The problem is, though, the recordings don't sound all that great. They're better, sure, but hard rubber isn't a great surface for accurate reproduction of sound. It's too rough with too many impurities, and the steel needles of the day wore them out pretty quickly. Fortunately, in 1895, someone realized that the perfect material to use was shellac. It's easy to work with and produces a smooth surface that would easily take the etching and playback process in stride and reproduce good results. A few small additions to the formula in the way of durability and color, because records not colored black looked gray or yucky brown and were unappealing, was all that was needed to produce a record that not only sounded great when played back, but was strong enough to withstand the needles across multiple playbacks. In fact, so tough were the shellac records that, on gramophones, it was the needles you started wearing out. From 1895 well into the 1950s, 12-inch shellac-based records were the way to go. Without that development, its doubtful recorded entertainment would have ever been more than a novelty, and future improvements, including tapes, CDs, and electronic formats like MP3s, might never have come along. And then how would you have been able to hear us? Oh, the other important thing that shellac does? The one that really means you wouldn't be able to hear us without it? Shellac is used as an adhesive in electronic equipment. For example, attaching very small wires to very small speakers without damaging them. Like in your headphones. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We're glad you're around and that your headphones are working well. At least, for the purposes of this episode, we assume you listen on headphones. Also, I suppose we should mention not all headphones use shellac anymore. But that's beside the point. Thanks for listening, however you listen, and whatever you listen with. We appreciate it. Thanks. Let it be known that we have adopted a new release schedule. After careful consultation with our patrons and friends, we've decided that Wednesday will be our new release day for the foreseeable future, unless something happens to change that. Like iTunes blowing up every Wednesday or something. Though that seems unlikely. But you never know, it could happen. Has anyone seen Google Play lately? If you've enjoyed this episode or others like it, head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top to find out how you can help support us either via Patreon or by some other means. We've got a new Patreon-exclusive bonus episode coming up next week, 
and pledging at the $10 level is the only way to hear that. There are other lower levels as well, so pick one you like and jump in. We're not picky. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Impertinent children ought to be given six coats of shellac and set up in public places as a warning to others.